everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Mac. I'm your host of Guitars OK YouTube show. And today I have a special guest with us today. Thank you, Peter Wolf, for being a part of the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Peter, let's uh, tell everybody out there um, what company you're working with and what's your role there for it. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I'm I'm with Nax Guitars. Um, Joe and I, Joe Nax and I, founded the company in November 2009. And um, I guess my I don't really have a position, but uh, I guess you could call it VP Global Sales and Marketing. I probably would would hit it best. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> you know, I'm I'm handling all the social media, all of our website, anything you see, any any pictures that you see, any videos you see is probably, probably a high likelihood that I have uploaded them and posted them. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm talking to everybody. I'm handling customer service. Uh, anybody who has any questions, whether on social media or via email, is usually um, it's usually me who responds to that. Now, I'll put in the links here on the show, and I'll actually put it up in the video right here, you know, the company and uh, how to say it, right? Because people down here aren't used to it out in Oklahoma, but we have some players like Brandon Autry, who was on a previous episode, who plays Nags Guitars. And one of the dealers in town, Barnett Music Exchange, sells Nags. And, Correct. Uh, I'm from the Northeast, up in New York State area, and I've seen players the last 10 years up there play them. So when I saw Brandon playing it here at the Colony in Tulsa, I walked up to him. That was the first question I asked <laughs> was, where did you get your nags? And he, I think he was surprised I knew what they were. So let's tell everybody where is nags located. And All right. So we are on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, close to a, a city called Denton. And the little village we're in is called Greensboro. A very lovely um, area. Yeah, I'm actually in Annapolis because I live in Annapolis. So I'm. I'm not at the shop every day. I usually go like once or twice a week, um, you know, for videos, con you know, talking to people, hanging with Joe, addressing whatever needs to be addressed. And other than that, I'm usually online wherever I'm at. So right now I'm at the Double Tree Hotel in Annapolis. <laughs> it's a good spot. I would sometimes like to work from here. Um, nice people. So that's where I'm at right now. Now, um, let's talk about Nags Guitars. So I know and I've heard of them, but there's a lot of people out there, unfortunately, they haven't heard of you guys yet. So let's talk about Nags, um, the history of Nags, when it started and why you guys started it. All right. So you probably know that I was with PRS for a long time. I was um, actually with them 23 years, I believe, all in all. Yeah. Um, I became a dealer in 86. Um, I flew to the NAM show, Summer NAM 86, and I met Paul and Clay Evans, the former president, and Mike Dealey, the sales manager, who is now our sales manager at NAGS. Um, and I first was a dealer for four years, and I started PRS Guitars Germany in Europe, handling all the European distribution. And then... Um, in 97, I became international sales manager for PRS and, and you know, worked hard to build the export business. I think it was eight or, no, it was 13 countries initially when I started. And I think when I left, you they were working with like almost 100 countries. And then, um, you know, once I was at PRS more often, I became director of global sales and marketing in 2003, which is also, I had moved already to the US. And um, that's when I kind of started to become friends with Joe. Um, if you will, I kind of saw who was the design force inside the company, uh, which I didn't quite know to the extent when I was going back and forth for a couple of years. And at some point, uh, Things a lot of things that were changing at PRS, um, personnel-wise, uh, company direction-wise, and I left in two thousand nine. I think it was February two thousand nine, and 
think Cho left the end of June 2009. And then we got together and kind of hashed out what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And that's how we did it. So when you started this, what what type of business model did you guys have? Do you have like four employees? Was there just a you know a small company model with a few builders? How did you guys start off the business? In the beginning, it was um, it was really only Joe, Danny, Dido, um, and myself, and then Lucas came on board, and so we gradually added people. Um, from there, I think we're fourteen now, thirteen or fourteen. Uh, folks and um, yeah you know it's it's been it's been an interesting ride it was obviously um, the worst possible time you could start a company back in 2008 2009 with everything that was going on uh, you couldn't you couldn't get a loan to save your life but uh, we were you know we had friends and people who supported us and uh, that's kind of how we were able to you know start slow and because we, you know, we had to do everything, build benches, find a building to start with, build benches, um, you know, the whole nine yards. It was uh, it was really hands on uh, from the beginning and it was, it was not easy, but we, you know, we gradually and um, successfully were able to um, implement and build the company and start designing. I think we designed... 11 or 12 models between uh, fall 2009 and our launch at the Frankfurt Messe in 2010 in April. Wow. That's a lot. So the designs of the guitars, let's talk about that for a second. Um, there's a show I have already an episode with Seth Lee Jones. He's a luthier here in Tulsa and a player, fantastic player. And please catch him if you can on, on one of my episodes playing and in his shop. Yeah. But I noticed that luthiers approach you know, business models different than like, say, a guitar player who's trying to make money playing guitar. So he obviously had a few designs in place when they started the company. So and that takes a lot more work, I believe, to start up, like you're saying, the tables, the benches, the tools, and to hire people that can work with guitars instead of just playing them, right? Sure. So how many, you said he had about 11 models or so in the first year? Can you um, let's see, some of those? Had, Joe already had Joe initially designed the chop tank and the seven while he was still at PRS. Um, the idea behind that on his end was, um, you know, there were, as I said, there were changes. Um, there were some difficulties and he always wanted to build something on his own. So I think he built the first guitar he made was the seven and then the chop tank followed. And, you know, Further down the road, we kind of try to bring these models into PRS uh, because they didn't have any six in the side headstock guitars. Um, but Paul didn't really want to do that. He wanted to stick with what he had come up with. And, you know, that kind of ultimately led to us leaving and, and starting next. So I've, I saw the guitars through the years as you guys have been developing them. There's been some changes in the bridges and tremolas and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I want to compliment you guys as far as you've gotten it already. Uh, every single nags that I see is so it's so beautiful. There seems to be a lot of craftsmanship um, like Brandon's like his pick guard. It was, I believe, made out of maple even. Correct. Yeah, we, we've wow. been using in the beginning in the first eight, nine, ten years, we've only used, uh, we only made pickguards out of wood. Wenge, for instance, or tulip wood, or ebony, or Brazilian rosewood even, stuff like that. Um, in, in recent years, a couple of people have had wanted plastic pickguards, so we have started doing that as well. You know, from a visual point of view, you know, have a red guitar, wants a white pickguard, stuff like that um but as for our bridges they're all our own designs we don't use any uh, bridges with the exception of the regular tunomatic bridge that we usually get from code uh, from um uh, tone pro sorry um so 
the tone broke bridges are, for instance, on two models, uh, on the Steve Stevens model and on Eric Stackel's Kanai, because they wanted um, they wanted tunematics. All all of our other guitars are uh, we use our own bridges, either the two in one influence line bridge, um, hardtail bridges for the chop tang and seven, or our tramp bridges. They are all wow. custom made. They are custom made at a small sh a machine shop in Baltimore. I saw some of the paint jobs as you guys have been, you know, progressing through the years. And holy cow, paint jobs have just been crazy cool. Yeah, Joe is Joe is uh, Joe is really really talented when it comes to um, finish. That's before he actually started to make guitars or started to make his own guitars. He was actually a finish expert. He was uh, at some point a uh, finish hall manager, then he became production manager. Later on at PRS, he became a uh, director of R&D and private stuff. So the, the man knows something about finish. <laughs> kind of like a good soccer player, right? Yeah, a good yeah. striker. You got to know how to finish. He was, he was actually a football player. Joe was a quarterback. Oh, really? Interesting. And now, let, since yeah, we brought that up, football. let's talk oh, yeah. about you for a second. You're from Germany, right? Is that true? You're from Germany, right? So where and that you is want, correct. And I believe we were just talking off camera about footballing, um, soccer, as they call it here in America. And I thought I heard you somewhere on an interview profess that you wanted to be a professional footballer at one point, right? Yes, that is correct. So growing didn't quite up, work out. I mean, I yeah. played. I played the highest amateur leagues. Um, there was I played a couple of test games for for what was called. Uh, Regionalliga back then it was basically the league before they started to call it Zweite Bundesliga but um, it, I was already playing in bands, I was already in, involved in a, in, in a music store in Germany my, you know that I was partner of ProSound Music Center so um, it kind of led to me pursuing more uh, career in, in you know in music and musical instruments um, but there was a chance at some point if i had maybe gotten a better contract or the right contract i may have we may have never talked <laughs> or i'd be watching you on tv or maybe interviewing you on my on a soccer podcast <laughs> that, that could have happened yes <laughs> now that you've mentioned guitar so i was going to ask you did you grow up in a musical family were there people, music constantly playing? Were there other guitar players in your family? Talk about what type of family you came yeah, from. Yeah, it was um, my, my, our household was, yeah, definitely a musical household. My dad was a violin and piano player uh, back in the day. Uh, he played in bands before World War II in Berlin. Um, and later on, too, um, my sister played piano. My brother played guitar. My younger brother played saxophone and flute. So we did have, and we had a piano at home. So, you know, there were Sunday mornings where we would like jam together <laughs> or, you know, play, play together. Um, and music has always been uh, a big part of my life. Uh, I've been listening to everything. Obviously, it was, you know, when I'm growing up, 70s, 80s, that's when a lot of things happened that hadn't happened before. So it's kind of a good time. Were you listening to like Beatles? Were you listening to like Led Zeppelin? Were you listening to ELO? Who were you listening to back in the day? All three that you just mentioned, I did listen to uh, anybody you can imagine from Yes to Peter Kings, Frampton, Beatles, <laughs> Rolling Stones, the whole nine yards, American bands, European bands, anybody, any anything that was that I liked and that I you know that I found good. Were you attracted to more blues rock or are you jazz based or did you just, you just didn't no, care? No, not so much. Not, yeah. not so much jazz, more like blues, blues rock, hard rock, um, heavy stuff as well. Um, but, you know, in, in, in one way or another, I was always more interested in melodic, melodic things, things that had melodies or arrangements that, that uh, spoke to me. So, no, but all in all, I would say I've been pretty open listening to pretty much everything, including classical music, always love classical music. And so it's a combination of many, many different styles of music and 
So when and, was your first you know, guitar? Songs. When was your first guitar? What age, basically? And what type of guitar was your first guitar? Um, I was actually a drummer before I was a guitar player. My first band, I was about 16. Um, I started to play drums. And I think played some acoustic guitar, like 16, 17, 18. But I didn't really start play, playing guitar in earnest before I uh, became partner in Pro Sound. Um, they needed somebody who could play and could sell guitars. They didn't really have Joe and my, my partners, Joe and Jürgen, didn't really have anybody who who would play guitar. So my my first job or my job when I first partnered with them was basically um, the guitar department overseeing the guitar guitar department selling guitars. And you know you, you see a lot of people come in, uh, great players. I learned a lot from really good players during that time. And then, you know, I started to look early on, like late 80, late 70s, early 80s, I started to look into American brands that were not readily available in Germany, such as Hamer, SD Curly. Um, I did Hamer from 78 to 9090. Good friends with Paul, good friends with Clay and Joel Danzig. So um, that's kind of how how everything led to looking for and finding mainly high-end U.S. brands. That's how I found PRS. That's when I started to get involved with them. Soldano amplifiers, Mike's a good friend of mine, and many others. So what was the market like back then right now, you know, in your mind? Back, you're talking 80s and so forth, PRS coming out. Well, compare the market back then to now. Um, I think the biggest difference was back in the day when you were in Europe, you had larger distributors that were carrying different brands and sell them to dealers. So while in America, manufacturers were selling directly to dealers, in Europe, they were selling to distributors who would import their product and then distribute it and sell it to dealers, handle all of import, counting. Um, so <clears throat> that was some business model when I got into the into the business or into the industry. And it has changed in the meantime. Um, I would say the most brands are sold directly now from manufacturer to um, dealers. So there's no mid, in some cases there's a middleman like a distributor in between, but uh, only for like, I would say the uh, less expensive brands, generally speaking. So the market back then, do you think guitar was um, hotter back then, back in the 80s, you know, with the MTV and all that? Because there was a yeah. lull in the market, it seemed like about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, something like that. But speak about that compared to after this post-pandemic. So from like, you know, the MTV era and now post-pandemic, what do you what do you think? Is there a big difference? Um, yeah, I, I do, actually. I think... Uh... I think there is quite a quite a difference. Um, Europe, Central Europe, Germany, England, Italy, probably um, Netherlands, Benelux uh, countries. There was a there was a huge wave of musical instruments purchases, sales, um, and I think a lot more people played actually music at that point in time. I think that. The number of people over there, at least, uh, the number of people that played music was probably greater than now. Um, I think in America, I think America is still the country that, when you look at it from a percentage point of view, uh, more people play musical instruments than in any other country. Interesting. I think, it's, I think it's four or five percent in the U.S., so out of 100 people, four or five play something. Um, I think in Europe, that number is uh, quite lower. Really? That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah I find that very interesting because I have, I have viewers in Brazil, which Bra I've been to Brazil. I worked in Central America. I was airborne infantry in Central yeah, I mean, America. I've been to Brazil twice, Brazil. two or three times still, yeah. They South seem Paulo. to really like their rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They got great players too down there, incredible players. No question. It's in the water. <laughs> it's in the yeah, water. Maybe something, yeah. Good <laughs> soccer players, too. Yeah, I like Argentina, though, so I might be making a few for friend, unfriending people here. I don't know, but uh, Argentina, I was down there, stationed there for a little bit, and they were super nice to me. And Brazil was nice, too, but 
Uh, yeah, I was in Argentina, Argentina too, Buenos Aires. I was two or three times there. Yeah, very, um, I liked it a lot. Got to have the beef. You got to try their meat down there. <laughs> oh, yes. So let's get back to guitars now. So do you think right now in the current environment, the boutique industry seems to be doing better than it used to, <laughs> like in the 80s? Seemed like in my experience growing up in the 70s and 80s, all my music friends bought Fenders, they bought Gibsons, they bought the bigger names. And now I'm in my 50s now, and a lot of my friends now are reaching out and buying like Seth Lee Jones's boutique stuff. They're buying Nags, they're buying, you know, uh, Sir, they're buying, the list goes on. So, right. So speak about the difference in selling like maybe a boutique guitar now compared to back then. Um. <clears throat> I think that probably by the mid 80s, late 80s, um, the co companies who just mentioned, like Gibson Fender, um, they, they had massive problems. Um, their quality levels weren't where they, where they should be, um, which I think allowed many other companies to even start. Um, I think the Japanese companies have always done a great job in in uh, branding and marketing the instruments, including designs, although in the beginning it was mostly copies. You now, if you think of Ibanez in the mid, early mid 70s, the Silver Series, they were all copies of Les Paul, Strats, or Tellies before they started to design their own models. But I would say um, around mid 80s, late 80s is when um, the, the boutique if you will, boutique companies started to emerge, which PRS was one of them in the beginning. I remember how small they were when I started to work with them, comparatively speaking. Um, and then, you know, there were changes in, in managements in certain companies. Fender was sold, Bill Schultz bought Fender, you know, after the CBS uh, situation. Uh, Gibson changed owners. Henry, Henry Chaskowitz bought Gibson, I think, in 86. Um, so these are all things that happened and changed due to, um, I would say changes in approach, changes in style, new companies, new names, new brands coming out. So I think it probably what we call boutique today is probably around the early mid eighties when it started. So that was when the rise of it came out, like you said, it, you know, it happened to come out because there was a like a little hole in the community. Yeah, I think that fill that hole. Yeah, yeah I think that uh, companies like PRS had had probably a lot of uh, a lot of it, a lot to do with it, um, simply because the quality was better than what was around um, at that point in time. You know, that's something that. You can give Paul credit for, um, not just Paul, all of us at that point in time, including Joe, because he was part of it. Um, so I think that the whole vibe of that time and the new companies and the new brands that came out, uh, I think contributed um, to the quality levels that we're seeing today um, tremendously. I believe so. It's kind of like in your Premier League soccer teams, you've got your elite comp clubs but when the other clubs start to do better the elite clubs have to step it up too and i that feel like correct. i feel like there's a little analogy there between the sports field and the the guitar field that you know you guys come along and push the envelope I and mean, you guys really are the nags is i mean every nags i've touched just recently at at barnett um wow i mean i have a custom strat 59 reissue i got from drew win over at guitar house of tulsa and it was kind of like buying, like uh, wanting a 69 Camaro. You know, that was my dream guitar and I got one. So now I'm looking, that's my number one. And now I'm looking at some other guitars and I'm going, Nags is right there. You know, I like the exotics. I like the Nags. I'm like the feel of it. So I want to compliment you guys on how Thank well, you. how well the quality assurance, I believe really is on them. And Thank how you. do you guys do? So how do you guys keep track of the quality assurance before they leave? Do you have somebody that checks them all? Do you have a yeah, yeah. Michael, uh, Michael is basically our sales manager. Michael is um, is uh, not only sales manager, and you know he's also he's also shipping. Um, he's working on guitars. He's preparing guitars. He's prepping them for shipping, and then does the shipping too. Um, so you have like a high level experienced guy 
<laughs> that is making sure that they go out and are perfect, as perfect as they can be. Um, you know, we, we didn't really have, if I look back, we didn't really have any issues as far as quality control is concerned, uh, concerned because everybody that works there is, is highly skilled and highly professional. So uh, we never really had any issues with finishes or frets or bending necks or anything like that. It has to do also with how we make the necks, um, the process of how we do that. And um, as I said, we didn't really have any issues. So it looked like yeah. they were like glued on or something. I mean, compared to the bolt style and all that. Yeah, we don't, right? we don't have any, we don't do bolt on necks. All of our guitars have set necks. Set necks. Okay. They all have set necks and there's um, also a slight, uh, depending on which model, the chop tanks and the sevens have, and the, and the tacos have slider neck angles. The influence, the influence line guitars, Kenai, Kia, Jenna, and GN have uh, greater neck angles and headstock angles. So your radiuses on the board, on your fretboards and stuff, do they change heavily? Do you have a big wide variance at all or for? Um, regular sevens have a, a fretboard radius of 8.5. Seven X with our bridges have uh, a radius of 14. And if it's a Floyd, the wow. radius is 16. Wow. All, all influence line guitars, um, have a radius of 12. Okay, that's a variance then there. So let's talk about, you have some artists, some signature artists and stuff working with you. I know Stevie Stevens is one of them. And so if you want to talk maybe about one of them or two of them, or maybe just how do you, how do you handle when a professional like that comes your way and you, does it take a few months, a year? How, you know what I mean? How do you do that with them? It, it depends. In Steve's case, I've known Steve, um, Steve Stevens for 36 years. I've known him from the Hamer days. I think I first met him in 86 at the Frankfurt show. We actually flew him in when I was doing Hamer. Um, and when we started next, about a year after, um, I had, I reached out to him, actually reached out to his wife first and she connected me with Steve and we've been working ever since. So we made him the first. Signature model, the SS1 in 2013, I believe. Yes. And then the second one, the SS2 in 2015. And then we started to make SSC models as an, as an ongoing, um, model, which we still make, uh, very successful, great guitar. And he's been playing it all, uh, ever since. So do you send them like prototypes, they play them, and then they send them back to you? How does it kind of work with those guys? Or is it, in, it um, even different? Yeah, it's it's different with everyone. In Steve's case, we sent him a couple of guitars early on, and then he had some ideas, um, got back to us. I'd rather do this or that, which ultimately led to his signature models. Same in Larry Mitchell's case. Uh, when he was actually a good friend also from the old New York days um, and a good friend of Steve. And he was in Maryland, I think it was 2013 or 14. And, you know, he called and said if he could swing by. So he came by, we talked and started to make guitars for him, which led to the seven, Larry Mitchell seven. Um we worked with Doug Rubberport for a couple of years. He had a sick model from us, which was basically a canai. And then uh, for the last five years, we had Eric Steckel as one of our um, signature artists. And we just added two more. Um, Tyler Tomlinson and Morgan Wallen's band. We made a Makia TT and then also Billy Morrison in Billy Idol's band. We just came out with a Kia, double cut Kia for him as a signature model. So it hasn't, it, it, it's going to be launched uh, by the end of the month. We're waiting for pictures, live pictures. <laughs> as soon as, as, soon as uh, they, uh, they come in, we'll, we'll send out press releases. Now, one thing you haven't mentioned, um, what about pickups? Do you guys make your own pickups? You, no. you use certain brands, you have a special brand you use, like raw vintage or whatever. So what do you do with pickups? Um, well, first of all, 
we talked about that obviously, but we believe that people who make pickups and have been making pickups and know what they're doing, and it would take us years and years and years to try to get there, let alone the process of making them. Um, so we use bare knuckles for all influence line. All the humbuckers are bare knuckles. English company, great, great pickups. Um, for single coils, we use Freilins. And for P90s, we use, uh, usually use uh, Lollas. There you go. Can't go wrong with those. <laughs> so those three uh, are... And then for the... Uh, I forgot, for the... Um, Kenai and Kia Chase, we use Seymour Duncans. And for Eric's uh, signature model for his ES Kenai TS, we use Seymour Duncan pickup as well. It's, it's a special pickup that we developed called Candy. And Eric is basically having a signature deal with them as well. So those are the pickup companies we use. That's really interesting because I know so many different players out there that are very particular about split coils or coil tapping or, or PAF, you know, so I figured you guys had to have a resource out there that you can tap into and just, you know, and just put them in plug and chug and, you know, roll with it. Right. So that's good. It's probably a lot of work to try and start over and do those on your own. Yeah. You know, we, we, we have a lot of experience. We'll, you know, we're all guitar players. We, we have been around the block for a while, so we know what's kind of out of there. We have, you know, we've played all these different brands and, and know what they, what they sound like and how they sound. So that's kind of what we have focused or zoomed into. What so, about so amps? Have you guys, have you ever just done any amps designs or have you ever interested in that? It's just not your thing. No, nah, it's not. It's, I don't, I don't think we're going to do uh, pedals or amps. Uh, I don't think we have any interest in doing that. We just want to make instruments. You want to make the guitars, right? <laughs> want to make guitars and basses and acoustics and yeah, there's great amps out there. And um, I don't think um, there's a huge need for more amps. There you I go. Have, I think we have the best amps out there that we ever had. What about strings? When you guys like sell like your basic your basic guitars, not your you know signature series, but you know your regular guitars, just going out to like Barnett and those kind of stores. Do you have a certain set of strings you guys put on there? A certain company you use? Yeah, they're all the same. By the way, there's no there's no difference between a guitar we ship to an artist or a guitar we ship to a dealer. Okay, you know I I always use you know use that phrase. We don't have a custom shop. We are a custom shop. So perfect. There is no difference. Anybody who gets a guitar from us, whether it's Steve Stevens or anybody, people we don't even know that go to a dealer and buy a guitar, it's it's the same deal, it's the same guitar. There is no differences. We we can make better guitars for famous people and less lesser guitars for not so famous people. Very good point. So do you guys have and a certain the, type of strings? Things? Yeah, we use uh, for all for all models. Uh, we use the Dario New York XL uh, for all solid bodies. Ten we use ten to forty six and hollow bodies eleven to forty eight. And then sometimes orders come in with like custom gauges or anything like that. But that's what we usually do. They all the the Dario, and uh, depending on what model it is, um, it's either ten to forty six or eleven to forty eight. Now, if I have some people out there watching and they own a music store and they want to reach out to you, they obviously can message me here at YouTube and I'll connect them with you. But are you the main man for that type of thing? If anybody's watching the show, and they want to contact Nags to start selling them. Um, they can either contact me or they can contact Michael Dealey, Michael at Nags Guitars, um, and he'll take care of them. He'll talk to them. And if if they're interested, absolutely. Um, we we you asked some. You asked something earlier that I didn't get to respond to. You asked, or you said that a lot of people know us, but they have never had a chance to play one. Um, so <clears throat> we are still adding dealers carefully, very carefully, but we do. So we are not in all states yet. Um, so there are parts of the U.S. where you have to drive several hours to find one. Um, we're trying to slowly change that, but also with within reason, because uh, you know we're we're not we're not able to make a uh, hundred guitars more a month, just like that. It doesn't work that way. So 
um, we still have sort of limited distribution and we are looking for people that um, understand and know what we're doing and that want to work with us. So if anybody has any interest, they can either contact contact me or or Michael Dealey. What's the order wait? If somebody wanted to order from you guys directly, is there like a 15-month wait, a six-month no. wait? How long are you talking for just a- Right now, we're looking at about three to four months. That's in average. So it's pretty reasonable. That's not bad considering you know the size of your company. How many employees Correct. did you say there were? How many what? How many employees? Oh, employees um, I think we're 13 or 14 altogether. That's pretty good then. You got a pretty fast turnaround for that. So yeah. um, let's talk real quick about materials on that on that subject because we're post pandemic now. Did you um, have any problems now post pandemic getting certain woods, getting you know neck body woods, anything paint, anything abnormal now? Um, I. Not really. Um, we, we've we've um, maneuvered through this whole time pretty well. Um, there have been there have been some shortages uh, for certain woods, but in general, we didn't really have any issues getting. We have different vendors, we have different suppliers. It's always important, you know, to have different sources. So, no, not really. We didn't really have any issues. Excellent. That's good to hear because I know after the pandemic, there were problems in different areas, you know, like the car companies couldn't get chips on the floor, you know, and all the lots were full of the trucks and and they couldn't get, couldn't get them sold. So it's nice to hear that, you know, and we heard that there was a boom. So touch, I've, uh, I talked to Drew Wynn once in a while, Guitar House of Tulsa here and them and recently now Barnett, but there's been, it seems to have been a boom here post pandemic with guitar sales and hopefully that you guys are still riding out some of that. Have sales been on the rise for you guys now? Yes, um, they have been um, continuously on the rise. So we're always doing better than last year, so far at least. Um, you know, and that's kind of important. Um, but it's also um, it's also controlled. You know, we talk about all these different things all the time. And, you know, we're careful what we do and how we do it. And it has worked out fine so far. Everything I've seen about NAG so far has been really thought out, like the from the websites to how you guys do business, to the guitars you make, the artists you're working with. And uh, I do want to compliment you guys for that because kind of like uh, my gripe with the uh, MLS soccer, they're, they've grown too quick and the talent pool isn't there to make the league interesting is to me. As much as, you know, and I feel that companies can do the same thing. They can go extend themselves too much, right? And and then next thing you know, they're maybe not making a guitar like as good as they should or as many as they want and so forth. But I really feel like you guys, from what I can tell, you guys have really been on track real well for a long time now. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to give you compliments for that because it's not easy to run a business and to run one well. There's a Thank difference. you. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's not easy. You're right. So what's the future now as we're wrapping things up here? What's any type of R and D? Is there any type of um, new guitar styles? What are you guys looking at as far as the future right now? You know, we always have we always have some new things on the horizon, but we don't really talk much about it until it until it happens. So um, we have a great selection and a great range of models. Um, so you know, one of the things that we that we may have done a little differently is you know we don't make we don't make eight guitars that are all that are all looking the same and call them different names. So if we have actually different models and different names, they're actually different guitars. That's a very good point. <laughs> you know, it's um, <laughs> you know, and then there's you know there's personal taste, there's personal likes and dislikes. You know, some people want to play bigger guitars, some people want to play smaller guitars, all of that. But I think we have a pretty tight model range uh, right now, and I don't think we need to uh, in, the, in the in the near future add any new shapes or models, but depends on what comes to mind and there's always room for something else if you feel like it. So really, really careful with um, that particular area. Um, you know, we just don't make something new every three weeks. Uh, we also want our guitars to be 
standalones that you know we want them to be accepted and appreciated for what they are so other than that um we always do work on cooking up things but nothing i can share with you that's okay that makes sense i like i used to work for r d for delphi which was is gm motors i used to be a drafter back in the day and yeah, I know. Like I design 95% of what we design would just get thrown out. So there's no point in even trying to tell everybody we were making it because <laughs> we were just constantly, you know, revising, revising and trying to get better. Because there's always that argument that you could say with guitars, do you want a lighter guitar? Do you want a heavier guitar? Do you want, you know, yeah, yeah, all yeah. That kind of stuff. So that's awesome. good. Now I want to, I want, as we're wrapping up here too, I want to requote what you said earlier. You said something about that you're not, a custom shop, right? You said, what'd you say earlier? No, I said, we, we like don't said, have a custom shop. Thank we you. We are a custom shop. I like that. That's it, a great expression. You know, pretty much every, as I said earlier, they all treat it the same way, no matter whom they're for. Um, Joe signs all of our guitars on the back of the headstock, no matter who they're for. We changed, we started doing that, I think, uh, January 1st, 22. Before Joe only signed um, limited runs and artist guitars. Um, now he signs them all, uh, which people really appreciate. And, you know, it's a hand signature, it's not a decal. Um, it's, you know, you have to find the right moment to sign it before the, the top boats and things like that. So it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, a little bit challenging, more challenging from a logistical point of view, but. I think it's a it's a it's a good thing, and people are very happy about it. That would be that's really interesting. You know, you're adding a little human touch to it. That you know, you're actually Zach from Mythos Pedals. I always like his shows from Mythos. You know, and he talks about how somebody enlightened him one time that as he's making all these pedals, they're going out there into the world, and they're like pieces of him, like his ideas, his sound in his heart and head that he's making, and they're going out there. And I feel like with you guys, the way you're describing this. I really feel that like this is the same type of philosophy with you guys that he's signing them. They're part of like you guys and who yeah, you yeah. are going exactly, out. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, you know, the other thing is because we are not, we're not super big. We're not super, we don't make that many. Mm -hmm. We kind of like sort of like think of them as, as our children or our kids or something like that. Uh, we also know a lot of times or most of the times we know where they're going um, we know where they went. If somebody five years later is asking, oh, I saw this guitar serial number, it's this and this, I can buy it, use, can you tell me anything about it? So we have we have a great archive, all the information is there. We can actually tell people when it was shipped, uh, wow. what are the components and things like that. That's, that's, that's what we uh, feel is important when you have valuable instruments like ours. So you really value the instrument and the customer, which is an important thing nowadays. I believe that human fact. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of customers, a lot of customers that have bought from us, um, that have bought instruments from us, have become really good friends. Not just um, end consumers, but also our dealers. We're pretty tight with our dealers. Uh, we are very tight with um, with end consumers and and buyers. Uh, we have a little group called the Nagsters. On Facebook, which is uh, where most of them are, including our artists and dealers, and that's a very tight, um, close knit community that have become friends uh, over time more than anything. So it's a really nice uh, group of people around the world. About two and a half thousand, I think we are now, um, that talk to each other about anything, not just instruments and sounds, but you know they share their birthdays of their children and families and stuff like that and meet each other, um, you know, whenever they travel from one point to the next where Naxa is. So um, I'm, I'm pretty happy and proud of that community. That's amazing. I love it. Now, do you guys ever do any type of like concert things or anything like that the Nags puts on? Do you ever have any type of gatherings that you guys actually like sponsor? Um, before the pandemic, we had a couple of... Um, meetings uh, or gatherings at NAM. Um, we may do that again, but probably more on a on a specific dealer. 
uh, basis. You know, perhaps we go to Nashville one day and all of our Nashville players meet and hang with us, something like that. So I can I, I, I can see that happening more and more in the future. That would be fantastic. As, as, I'd love as, to see as that. trade shows, and I, let me add that, as trade yeah. shows become less important, in my opinion, um, we may do more of that. Now that's a very good, that's a topic for a whole nother show, you know, cause I'm, I was actually invited out to Nam or Nam, if you want to say, um, as an influencer. And I was counting the cost with my wife just recently, you know, the hotel, the flying there, the, you know, what would I have to bring to walk around and, oh my goodness, it became pretty high. And, you know, I mean, I know their theory that if you can meet five people or five companies that would help you then it's worth your money. They always try to talk about that, which is true, but you do have to weigh out like, you know, right. Like if you're bringing employees and getting hotels and bringing gear and can't you just do your own event in Nashville or, or Tulsa, right. T-Town, come on down to Tulsa. Brandon will come out and play. Right. And all that. So, um, sure. so that's a, I feel like that's a big question compared to 20, 30 years ago. Right. You could, is it, am I right? Yeah, I think it has it has a, lo a little bit to do also, not a little, a lot to do also with um, how communication works, you know, with social media and Zoom. You know, I, I'm, we're having a meeting right now and I can talk to you undisturbed. There's, <laughs> there's nobody making noise. There's nobody tapping on my shoulder. There's nobody who wants to take a picture. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. you're talking and um, I don't. I don't believe anymore, and I've done enough shows in my life. I've done probably 35 names, winter names, and summer names, and Frankfurt shows, and Italian shows, and Spanish shows, and Japanese shows. Um, I think it's, um, I think it's, uh, in some cases, necessary to personally meet. Um, but since we're communicating all the time anyway with everybody. Um, I don't really feel the need to go to NAM, um, you know, pay 5K for food, spend 5K on, on hotels and food, um, and to meet the same people that I would have met or could have met on Zoom or on Facebook or on Instagram or talk to via email. So, so it's, I think it's shifting. I think it's changing. And I don't know, I could be wrong, but I don't think NAM is ever going to be what NAM used to be before the pandemic. That's what I've heard. And that seems to be the consensus. So if you guys do have a get together at all, like if you do Nashville, let me know, reach back out to me because I'm interested in vlogging, you know, coming out like, you know, with cameras a little bit and vlogging stuff behind the scenes and doing all that. I offered that to Drew Wynn. You know, if he does guitar shows, he works with Tom Bugovac, all guys out in Nashville. And then Seth Lee Jones works with Mule a lot up in, you know, Mule Resophonic. And so uh, as these things are going to start happening next year, I'm interested. And Nashville's not that far. I'm in Tulsa. So I can always yeah, jump in, the, yeah. jump, jump in would, my Jeep and get there, you know, and, and meet I will you. definitely let you know when it happens. That'd be awesome. I'd love to. That'd be so great. And I was in Chicago this weekend. You saw at CME and I was able to meet Nathaniel Murphy and, Oh my gosh, what a gem. What a guy. He's so nice. Although, although I don't know, you're you're also a very, very nice guy too, Peter. You've Thank got you. a very Thank good you. personality, good demeanor. You have that same kind of vibe. I don't know. You got that, you know, it's you're a gem too, Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it, man. I love it. And and so uh, I'm gonna end here with uh what's the best way to get a hold of you? And I'll post it here on the in the video. So um <clears throat> Best way is probably my email is Pete at brandwolf.net. Okay. You have it. And then um, if anybody wants to talk to Michael, that's Michael at nextguitars.com, our sales manager. And um, we, between the two of us, we usually uh, handle every incoming inquiries, uh, whether they are from end consumers, customers, dealers, distributors, media. So, that should work. It's that also on the, it's also on the website. It uh, it has both our email addresses on our website and the contact. I'll post it all here in the video when I bring it in, and then obviously okay. in the links below and so forth. But you know, I do want to say thank you, Peter. I'm a small small show just started recently, so 
uh, it's kind of like my my hobby on the side and uh I really appreciate the fact that you reached out and were interested in coming on. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to all the viewers, the, the, the people that subscribe to the show and new viewers, please click the subscribe button, uh, ring the bell, leave some comments. It helps in the algorithm for YouTube. If people leave a few comments, claps, whatever, you know, and uh, which all I'm trying to do is just trying to help out the guitar community and be a part of it. And uh, I just love doing this stuff. And I love meeting such great people like yourself, Peter. So stay on the line. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Please email me, comment. If you have any questions for Peter, I'll get back to those people and then pass it on to you. Sound good, Peter? All right. Sounds good. Thank All you right, so thank much. Thank you.